a lot of a lot of um, county councillors across Devon and uh, MPs across uh, the south of England. And he also contacted 61 schools in the region as well and uh, sent them all information leaflets provided by the Dyspraxia Foundation and, um, and uh, an outreach video that I'll show you in the next slide time. He also um, was invited to do an interview with BBC Radio Devon, which was a, a really impressive thing uh, for him to do, having really no experience of uh, developmental coordination disorder beforehand and having really thrown himself into this world and done a, such a fantastic job with it. The next sort of big takeaway though that we did from this um, project was to create an animation about dyspraxia aimed at um, school children in particular, raising awareness in local schools. Although it turned out that the animation was quite suitable for many different venues. And this was a new process for me as well. And it was quite interesting because I really didn't have a great sense of how we would go about this and who we would select to do it. But we were lucky enough to actually find uh, an animator and artist, Charlotte O'Neill, who has dyspraxia herself, which meant that we could create this video and you know, with, with her kind of really authentic insight into the topic as well. So it was a really nice collaborative venture here between her and Jack and creating the script. And we ended up with something that we're really, really proud of. It's just a two minute video that I'll show you now. Hello, I'm here to talk to you about dyspraxia. Dyspraxia, otherwise called Developmental Coordination Disorder, or DCD, is a neurological difference mainly affecting movement and coordination. It's present from birth and is lifelong and can affect anyone, no matter their gender or sex. It affects around 5-6% to of the population, which is roughly 1-2 to two children in each class of 30 students. So, how does it affect people? Dyspraxia presents differently in different people, but mainly affects the ability to perform fine and gross motor skills. Writing by hand, tying shoelaces and doing up buttons can be difficult and might take more time and effort than other children. Dyspraxic children can struggle with playing sports or walking upstairs, and they may bump into things or trip over more often. Some people may also struggle with organisation, planning, sensory processing and executive function. As people get older, they may have difficulty performing day-to-day -day activities like driving, cooking and putting on clothes. It isn't a learning disability, and it doesn't affect intelligence, but without the right support, it can affect learning, and the physical challenges of DCD can be accompanied by emotional ones too. Sadly, dyspraxia can still go unrecognised in education and healthcare settings. Without recognition, dyspraxic people can be mocked or misunderstood by their peers, or be told that they need to work harder. This can be frustrating and make them sad. However, dyspraxic people can be smart, hard-working, creative and determined. With some understanding from those around them, they can really flourish and a little extra support can go a long way. If more people are able to understand what dyspraxia is, we can ensure that people will receive the right support if and when they need it. Together, we can create a happier and healthier environment which is better for everyone. So we'll share that video around at the end as well for anyone. And I really appreciate you um, disseminating amongst all the networks that you might have. It's uh, a resource that's going to be there forever if you think it's uh, worth sharing around. So after that, we were interested in uh, doing some slightly more active PPI to you know, motivate future research programs. So Jack conducted um, several one-hour semi-structured interviews with some dyspraxic adults, some dyspraxic children, and teachers who work with uh, dyspraxic individuals as well. And also a survey asking about a range of questions about future research. And we got 41 respondents from sort of across the board of stakeholders here, occupational therapists, SENCOs, teachers, dyspraxic adults, and children. And uh, I'm just going to sort of present a few word clouds from this here. Um, I'm certainly no qualitative expert. And uh, if anything, this project has highlighted to me how I do need to build up this qualitative skill set. But I do quite like these in the context of a presentation. And you, you certainly see in the answer to the question of how DCD affects you, we see things focused around you know, work and coordination and also some things maybe a bit less obviously related to motor control, like communication and spatial awareness and planning and forgetting and things like that. 
So obviously a lot of people feel that this is a part of their DCD. There's a really strong community uh, with dyspraxic, particularly in the uh, um, adult community. They are um, very active on social media and um, people with dyspraxia are always very keen to be engaged with research and particularly the sort of PPI stuff, um, which has been a real pleasure to work with, I would say. Views on research, there's a clear uh, desire for support, but also for adults. I mean, I would say that the diagnosis of dyspraxia and developmental coordination disorder is almost entirely in schools. And even in schools, it's managed in a rather strange ad hoc way that varies from region to region in the UK. <clears throat> There's really very little in terms of adult support for developmental coordination disorder, either formally or, you know, in, in terms of what your peers would recognize as a disability that needs support. And this is why raising awareness, I feel, is, is so important. It's also characterized often as a largely male thing, but clearly girls and women suffer with uh, the issues around this in, in a very different kind of way than boys might. And the last thing I wanted to talk about is virtual reality, which is um, what I've been doing a lot of research on in the last couple of years myself. Um, putting on a virtual reality headset, such as uh, here in Oculus Rift, is an easy way to immerse people in a, a pretty amazing new environment. And over lockdown, it's kind of exploded in popularity, I would say. Um, you know, here's a little picture of my eldest son um, wearing the Vir Oculus Quest 2 headset for the first time. Um, back about a year ago to this day. And, you know, here he's traveling through an underwater ocean, looking at sharks and things like that, which, you know, during a period when you can't go outside and you're not able to go to school and things like that was a, was a really great thing to be able to do with him and a really, really nice experience to widen some horizons. So we received funding to um, collect, to get and buy a lot of these Oculus Quest 2 headsets and uh, send them to people's houses to experience for two weeks at a time in a fairly unguided fashion, um, which was a really sort of exciting opportunity for me. I've, I've certainly never done anything like this before. I'm an experimental psychologist who brings people into the lab and, you know, rather cautiously puts expensive bits of equipment on top of them rather than sending the expensive bits of equipment to their house to do with what they please. But actually it worked incredibly well. These are expensive but not prohibitively they're between two and three hundred pounds for a headset so you know you can accept that some of them will get broken although none of them did um, in all fairness and we sent these to uh, eight children with developmental coordination disorder and their families and four adults with dyspraxia and they received this with fairly minimal guidance from us. So a bit of an instruction set about how to set it up and some suggestions about what sort of games they could install and what sort of things they could do. Um, but largely we just sent it to them and left them to it. Now, this was the easiest thing I've ever had to recruit for. You know, do you want to have someone send you a virtual reality headset and we will pay you um, 20 pounds to uh, participate in this uh, study to compensate you for basically the inconvenience of taking part in some follow-up focus groups with semi-structured interviews. Uh, we were, we were um, not struggling to recruit for this at the time. Now, the vast majority of our participants installed Beat Saber, which some of you might have heard of. It's this game where you're um, in the sort of musical tunnel almost with these blocks with arrows flying at you and your job is to kind of chop them out of the air um, in time with a beat. And it sort of tricks you into dancing almost. Um, it's a really sort of nice popular thing. Uh, there were also some more traditional virtual reality, more passive experiences, things like a roller coaster simulator, or there's a nice one on the International Space Station where you can float around in zero gravity, which is uh, incredibly nausea inducing. Uh, in terms of feedback from how people felt when they first opened the box for the headset, we, you know, excited was the number one thing about, you know, look cool, futuristic, and they're intrigued and things like that. And from the focus groups, we got screeds and screeds of texts and, you know, really, really interesting conversations and, you know, some interesting challenges in getting children to talk about this with their parents in the room and things like that. But we did get some really useful things, you know, so here's just some choice quotes that are shared with permission from the speakers. Right? In terms of skill training and exercising, it definitely improved as time went on. I think that 
I think that's something that could help other people. If it's something consistently that they're using to help with coordination, as much as you find it difficult, I think it can help. It was really fun. It's a good way to exercise too. I know dyspraxic people maybe find exercise quite difficult. A lot of people don't really exercise as much as they should. I think the headset would be a good way to get more exercise. If he had the facility to practice at home, but this game is fun and subconsciously he's improving his coordination and hand-eye coordination, there's a huge potential for that to be um, incredibly useful. And you know, this was a parent of um, a child with dyspraxia here. We also asked them about their thoughts of um, virtual reality as an assessment tool, something that could maybe sit midway between a questionnaire and the formal movement ABC battery. And, you know, here we got some, um, some parents saying, we can only see it as a positive. My child found all the processes had to go through for his diagnosis pretty stressful. If it was all through games, not in a clinical setting, that would be amazing and maybe even fun. And this isn't, quite as barmy as it sounds because what virtual reality headsets are doing is they are fairly precisely measuring your hand, your head position, um, and using that data to show where you are in the world around you. It's essentially doing a fairly low cost but effective version of what I do in my lab when I measure people's upper limb kinematics. And there's plenty of virtual reality headsets now that have eye tracking built into them. And eye tracking with virtual reality is actually quite technically simple. This thing is stuck right in front of your face and gets rid of many of the problems that you have with conventional eye tracking. We've been doing some of this stuff in our lab. Here's a, a project that uh, one of my PhD students, Tom Arthur, has been doing working with uh, autistic individuals, um, looking at their hand-eye coordination in a tennis sort of task here. These green dots just show the, um, the eye traces of the individuals. And you could easily imagine something like this forming a really nice, precise metric of this aspect of someone's motor control skill in a more formalized version of an assessment tool for developmental coordination disorder. And the last thing that was a bit of a surprise to me, but I'm really excited about pursuing in the future um, was around reducing anxiety and widening participation in sports. So one, one person said, I, I agree that anxiety affects physical performance and therefore getting to be able to practice in VR helps. My child is quite dependent on tech for minimizing his anxieties and supporting him. So VR, I see this as an enhanced tool for this that he could bring between settings that help with transitions too. Or one adult says, I feel that I could do some workouts if you like, not in a room full of people on my own without having to go anywhere and see people I don't know or join a gym or whatever. And what I'm really interested in doing is collaborating with a company called Rezl, who have developed this virtual reality football training program, um, really designed for Premier League football clubs. Uh, many Premier League football clubs uh, pay fairly large license fees to this company to um, you know, allow their players to practice in virtual reality, tracking the positions of their feet and legs with these little markers that are stuck to the bottom of them. But you can really easily imagine a situation where children who are not keen on playing football in the playground because a lot of people are staring at them and they don't enjoy the feeling of being the worst one on the field, um, getting a chance to practice some of these things that really are a big part of an individual social life at that age in private, uh, in a slightly more fun, gamified way, away from the pressure and social drama of uh, all that stuff in the playground. So that's really where I want to leave it today. Um, I'll leave you with this really nice uh, word cloud that answers the question of how are you empowered, empowered by your dyspraxia? And you can see there's lots of different ways. People feel very positive about their dyspraxia as well as you know, negative about it. But thank you so much for taking the time to listen to me today. And I'd love to hear any questions you have or comments you have on the research or the outreach. Um, I gather there's a really ex a real body of expertise in this audience here. So I'm, I'm really excited to, to hear all of that stuff. I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you, Gavin. That was really interesting. And um, it looks like it would be great to be part of your lab. I'm jealous. Um, I want to apologize as well. I, I'm furious with myself for forgetting to record. So I got the second half. I got all your outreach stuff. I'm so sorry. Um, that's, so, and I'm sorry for the interruption halfway through as well when it started recording. I'm not um, I'll, I'll just start again. <laughs> yeah, off you go. Um, so we've got, um, so 
if anybody does want to ask a question, you can put it in the chat. You can raise your hand. We've got one question in the chat already. Um, you can raise your actual hand or your digital hand. I saw Catherine raise her. Um, so I'm going to ask this. I've, I've got a question as well, which I'm burning to ask, but I'll be polite as host. Um, so the first question was from Lynn um, asking, were there any intra-subject patterns? How about the time it took each group to approach and pick up the various size boxes? And uh, then I will come to Catherine and then Andy. That's a really interesting question. Um, we deliberately gave this task almost no constraints in that participants hear a beep, this thing goes back, and then they reach out and pick it up. So there certainly weren't any group differences that we could see in how long it took them to get there. I would be loath to call this even reaction time, really, because we're not telling them to move fast or anything like that, even though we are giving them an imperative go queue. So there's huge variation from person to person that would really swamp out any hope of seeing any differences between the group. We did look and see whether there was going to be any sort of differences in the way they interpreted our instructions for want of a better word, but there wasn't anything obvious in there. But to be honest, the kinematics and eye data, we're getting quite small samples now because we just lost so much data in this triage process. Thanks. I'm going to go to, to Catherine now. Hi. Um, thanks for a really interesting talk. I have two questions, if that's allowed. Um, so your evidence kind of suggested that there, well, there wasn't evidence for like prediction um, issues in DCD. So what do you think, it, what's the alternative? What What is the the cause of motor impairments, for example, if, if there isn't evidence for prediction problems? And the other question was more about um, like the public um, engagement or reception. So what kind of barriers do children with DCD experience in learning and what could teachers do to support this in the classroom? Okay, I'll do the, um, the first question. Um, no, in fact, I'll, I'll do the second question first. Um, I, I think that the barriers that children face, if it's purely a, a motor issue, the old story was that it's a lar largely a social thing. So children are, are, are left out of this big part of their development. They're not, not picked in the football team. They don't play the sports. They hang around on their own while everyone else is playing sports. I suspect there's a little bit more to it than that. Certainly um, many of these dyspraxic adults we've talked to really do feel like they have fairly... ADHD like profiles and you know certainly they, they feel like they're messy they feel like there's uh, you know they're, they're unable to stay on top of things they feel very tired by the end of the day whether that's uh, you know related to motor difficulties or things like that and struggle to use a keyboard or use a pen and paper all these things that are sort of inherent in their day jobs and you know I I, I think the, this sort of level of fatigue that children suffer throughout the day could be something really important and I'm not in any way an educational psychologist or really even in this world. So I'd be loath to take too strong a view on this, but I suspect that the same sorts of support that children get for things like dyslexia, beyond the out of the class helping you read in an individual kind of way, but the, the sort of acknowledgement that this day is gonna be harder for them than for the average child might be something of, uh, of value to take forward for teachers. Uh, remind me the first uh, part of the question again. Um, yeah, thank you. I oh, was yeah, just no, wondering... no, I remember, I remember, yeah. yeah. So what, what do I think it's going on if it's not prediction? And yeah. the answer is I really do not have a strong uh, answer for that one yet. I really don't know. I think that what we're seeing from this machine learning data is that our children are kind of clustering together with bunches of different things. Now, I, I'm not really cognizant enough to explain all of this properly, um, but what we're seeing are sort of rather than a nice delineation in metrics between children with and without DCD, we're seeing this cluster of children with DCD and this cluster of children with DCD and this cluster of children with DCD and this cluster overlaps a little bit with the controls, but these two clusters don't. So I suspect that the hunt for a single unifying thing is uh, a little bit flawed. And you know, there's a bit of a mantra about if you've met one child with DCD, you've met one child with DCD. 
And I suspect that uh, holds true quite a lot. It really does seem like it's a very um, multifaceted thing that varies hugely from child to child and thus person to person. Brilliant, thank you. Um, so we've got a few hands up. Uh, I'm gonna to go to Andy next, then it's Caroline, Matt, Mahmoud, and then there's uh, Randy in the chat. So Andy first. Hi, thanks Gavin, that was, uh, that was really interesting. Uh, I've had some connections with DCT work over the years. So that's a little space since I was last involved. Um, I mean, I'm interested in the kind of the prediction angle. And I wonder if you really have kind of given up on that yet. I mean, one thought that strikes me in particular is that as you said, the um, the uh, the uh, weight judgment task it seems to be something that's very kind of hardwired. You get that kind of effect across you know populations, uh, and I wondered if maybe there was some possibility that you're kind of looking in slightly the wrong place. That it might be that more processed sensory motor um, uh, areas might be where you might start to see some more of that kind of deficit. I just wondered what your thoughts were on that. Yeah, you know, I would completely agree. I think I sold this task to the funders as this is the purest metric of prediction that we have in motor control. I'm not really sure I believe that five years later. I think that it is a task that has its own vagaries and, and foibles. And, and in, in many ways, it's it's a task without a task. You know, you're, you're picking things up and just holding them there. So I, I, I suspect that there are um, more interesting ways we can go, even with this object lifting paradigm that, you know, become a goal directed task all of a sudden, rather than the slightly odd, pick it up to experience how heavy it is, which is uh, easy, but uh, a painfully artificial sort of version of a task also. So yeah, I, I definitely agree with what you said there. And, and you know, I, I think that there's many avenues to go down for this prediction narrative so far. All I'm saying at the moment is that none of the data in this task really have any hint of it whatsoever. Um, I've, I've got something to ask on that, but I'm gonna come back to it. I'm gonna to go to Caroline next. Hello, thank you very much. It was a really interesting talk. Um, I just wanted to ask you two things, whether you'd considered um, any link to re um, so I retained reflexes or to vestibular or proprioceptive um, issues with children, because I've heard both those being talked about in the past, but I don't know if that's true or not. I'm not familiar with the, um, the first one you mentioned. In terms of the vestibular and proprioceptive, um, I don't know. I, I, I think that the object lifting task doesn't have any, any of that kind of stuff built into it. It's sitting down. It's pretty static. We probably could have even had children in a chin rest doing the task if we wanted to. In terms of virtual reality, one of the reasons we wanted to do this outreach was to check whether this was viable at all or whether children with DCD would put these headsets on and be, oh, my God, I feel nauseous or fall over or, you know, something like that. But no, I mean, what we actually saw is the pretty standard dichotomy of children find it a piece of cake and the parents are appalled at being in virtual reality and feel sick. And uh, yeah, or, you know, the father-in-law fell over kind of story is what we uh, got from some of our feedback. But yeah, we, the children got nothing but good stuff out of it, which was, you know, really gratifying to hear. So I, I mean, not much of a research driven answer there, but that's, that's what I have on that side of things. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm going to Matt next. Thank you. Yeah, really interesting talk. Um, I've got another question about the, the weight lifting task. And um, I think you said at the beginning that this is a, a cognitive impenetrable effect in terms of even if you know that this still, effect still occurs. So, so does that mean that you wouldn't see any learning taking place across trials at all? And, you know, because that sounds like, yeah, I guess that's the first part of it. I was gonna ask, yeah. yeah, exactly. In, in terms of your experience of object heaviness, you, you see no learning whatsoever. The illusion doesn't go away. Right. In terms of the forces that people apply, we see a very rapid learning. And you are picking up those objects with different forces on trial one, but trial three, four, five, you're kind of getting it pretty much just right. But the cool thing here is that even though you're picking them up with the same forces after five trials, the magnitude of the illusion you experience is exactly the same as it was on trial one. So this is how I got into this whole world. There's this like weird separation between the adaptation rates of the action and the lack of adaptation of the perception. Um, mm -hmm. Now, you know, there's a more complicated story that I can spin on that, which this probably isn't the right forum for, but 
yeah, that's the bottom line. Over short time scales, we see no washing away or learning away of that uh, perceptual effect. And even over longer time scales, like the decade or so I've been playing with this illusion, I still get it just as strong as I did. Right. So do you think um, there would be any differences in response across your groups then, rather than just perception? Right, so how they how they respond and the numbers. How they learn, if they're adapting over, over, over trials. Oh, right, yeah, in terms of um, the fingertip forces. Mm. Um, we don't see any, no. Right. But this probably isn't quite the right paradigm to look for that in because we've got these two sizes and these two weights, and that kind of messes up the pretty motor control picture. We really focused our motor control stuff on that trial one prediction thing rather than the rates of adaptation, which we can't look at quite so cleanly. Thank you. Cheers. Thanks, Matt. You asked my question, which was whether there were group differences of how quickly they adapted to the task. I'm looking at something, the schema formation. But anyway, I will now go to Mahmoud. Um, Matt also asked part of my question about the adaptation over time as well. Um, uh, but I did want to know, because you say there's no sensory mode of addiction, but I was wanting to know whether it could be a result of rhythm processing because one of the things that I know people with DCD usually have is they have they usually have to follow some form of rhythm in order to get uh, in order to predict what's going on and that has been argued to be one of the contributing factors of motor control so I was just wanting to know to what extent is the sensory motor prediction a, a result of rhythm uh, processing as opposed to let's say I don't know um, prediction in terms of the Bayesian sense. So rhythm. Yeah. It, the question isn't formulated that well. That's no, no, no. I I, I I guess I understand the question. I hadn't I hadn't heard it brought up before um, or, or considered in this way. So I, I'm just trying to wrap my head around a little bit um, where it would fit in this kind of task. Because, you know, obviously I sort of see where it could fit in something like a, um, a locomotion task or something like that. But yeah, I mean, I, I really don't have any any ideas, but I, I mean, do you have any any thoughts on how this this could sort of more formally fit in here? I'll send um, the buck back to you, I'm afraid. No, that's fine. Um, I did ask. So the adaptation, I was just thinking, if they're having to predict something pri uh, with their prior knowledge and say, oh, this is lighter than it really is, and it's heavier than it really is, um, if I could say, okay, uh, I'm able to predict it, because when I know, because of my dyspraxia, some of my distract tendencies. Uh, if I try and pick up a piece of paper, there's a bit of a ribbon for me to try to get it. Once I get, if I get figured out first time, I do, yes, I got it, all in one go. But if I don't, I have to ask to think of how to get it after a few tries. And it almost has to follow like a kind of a musical rhythm. I know mm. that sounds really weird, but there's always something I, I struggled with. And this this isn't evidence, it's just anecdot anecdotally. Well, you know, I'll certainly take anecdote over um, non-anecdote. And I think this is this is really quite interesting. I mean, I think what you say about even that thinking about the picking up of stuff. So I would say something that we imply very heavily with this task is that it is not something you have any real cognitive access to. You do not cognitively think or explicitly think, I'm going to pick this thing up with this amount of force. And you don't even do that relationally. This happens kind of automatically without any effort. It's not the sort of thing that is impaired in a dual tasking context. And, and I think the fact that maybe um, having the sort of forced cognitive uh, monitoring of actions in this way might be a, a sort of interesting way to think about this as a way that the normal, the normal motor functioning in this kind of task might be different for want of a better term. So yeah, I'm not, I don't really have anywhere concrete to go with that, but I, I think there's sort of interesting roads to go down here. Thank you for your answers, it was really helpful. Um, thank you. And so now we have in, Randy in the chat who said, I'm a high school teacher, computer science teacher, and have a few DCT diagnosed students in my classes. I wonder if there are any studies of subject Oh, um, subject of study and eventual career selection for DCT diagnosed students. Feel free to jump in, Randy, if I've not made your point clear enough. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. I'll, 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 I'll address it. It's really interesting. Um, I don't know of any. Um, I would say that the study of 
dyspraxia in adults is, is woefully underfunded. There's almost no place you can get funding to do that kind of research. And uh, as a consequence, there's really not very much known about even simple things like career outcomes and things like that. From my own hanging around the uh, dyspraxia social media groups, um, which you know I've, I've been invited to do so for a number of years now, I don't see any obvious patterns. I see people here, there, and everywhere, all of whom are uniformly frustrated about uh, the lack of uh, accommodation society makes for them. And I think that um, raising awareness will be a big part of this. And you know, I, I, I guess schools are a, a big part of where things are improving, particularly early school years. I think universities could do a lot more to improve their provision for uh, people with dyspraxia. Um, it's not something talked about all that much in independent learning uh, programs, at least at, at my institution. And it's probably varies hugely from place to place as well, but it certainly doesn't have the, the name awareness of something like dyslexia and the, you know, the obvious accommodations that can be made. So uh, a long non-answer to your question, I'm afraid. Thanks, Gavin. I've just got a, a, a comment from Lynn in the chat um, who has a son who has dysgraphia and is dyspraxic. And um, it's the challenging area, which is the, the, the initiation, the body not being in sync with what the person consciously is trying to do, which I suppose is, is the area that is not pulled up by the task because it's not actually a conscious decision to, to pick up something with a certain amount of force. I don't know, I'm answering for you, but if you have a comment on that, go ahead. No, I don't. But again, it's 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 really interesting to see. I, I this was um this was brought up um in another uh in another context. I have a, a colleague doing work with uh, Parkinsonian freezing and analogy learning, and um yeah, I I, I definitely see some uh, some similarities here with this initiation idea, and uh, yeah, maybe maybe the um the sort of forced conscious monitoring comes back to Mahmoud's uh, question earlier on, and. Uh, yeah, there's some, some really interesting stuff there. Yeah, I had actually, that's what I was thinking um, when Amoud was talking about the rhythm side of things, because you do have this with people with Parkinson's and I'm not, you know, conflating Parkinson's with dyspraxia or anything, where they can, and, and I think Andy told me, knows a bit more about this, where walking through a doorway is near impossible, but if you dance through the doorway, you can do it. So it's that tapping into, a different conscious network. I don't know. I don't know whether I think Andy's gone now, but um, I, it's just a thought. Sorry <laughs> about, uh, but, uh, you know, based on the rhythm comment. Um, somebody has, has said actually that Harrowell 2018 looks at GCSE outcomes for DCD and TD chin, um, teenagers, if anybody, and Kirby, somebody called Kirby as well. Um, do we have, we've Got, we're de dead on five, um, so we probably haven't got any questions for any time for um, any questions now, but thank you so much, Gavin, for a really, really interesting talk. And I'm still furious with myself for not recording the first half. <laughs> um, uh, really great. Are, are you, um, I've, I've shared the um, link in the chat, but also we will publish the link to your outreach video. Um, so thank you very much for that. So yes, I just want to to once again say thank you, and I'm looking desperately for my applause um, thing <laughs> so I can do that. Um, but thank you very much. Um, no, thank, and, thanks so much for having me, and thanks oh, for the discussion afterwards as well. It's uh, you know I I love this kind of thing, and I've really missed it over the last uh, the last year or so. So I, I really appreciate it. Oh, I appreciate it. I'm sure everybody else does too, based on the comments in the chat and the hand clappings. So thank you. Thank you very much. I'm going to hang on for a while if you wanted to hang on. But um, thank, thank you, you, Gavin. That was really interesting. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everybody, for attending and, and being and participating so well with such great questions. Can I just ask you, Gavin, you mentioned um, about an analogy in Parkinson's study. Mm -hmm. What well, can like what was what was that actually? Right. So when you get this sort of freezing behavior, or, or or you know even akinesia where you're trying to start off the movement, um, I, I won't do this justice. It's uh, by a colleague of mine called Will Young, who um, 
was at Brunel University and has now been here for the last few years. But you tell people to imagine swaying like a tree to kind of get that rhythmic start of the movement going. Mm. And this worked so much better than they'd imagined for what seems like a slightly, uh, you know, out there idea for how we can get this going. But, you, you know, in some like 14 out of 15 people, they tried this on it instant effect, a bit like the sort of dancing videos that you see. Nice. So they're, they've, they're now following this up in a slightly more detailed way. Um, but th this idea of analogy, um, analogies for motor control feeds into this embodied cognition idea and, uh, you know, has, uh, has been sort of rumbling away slowly in the background as, um, yeah, this potential treatment or, or therapy or something like that. But I, I don't think it's received very much, I guess, credible evidence up until fairly recently. Right. Yeah, I've seen, I've seen some work where people are saying, you know, or imagine like they're given a the task of drawing something and they're like, imagine you're painting like a painter or, and you see these differences in the like velocity curve of, of mm. movements where they're kind of, all overlapping and joined up rather than fast and stop and fast and stop. But yeah. I wasn't aware there was other work in, in Parkinson's, which I'll have to have a look at. So thank you very much. No, no worries. Cheers. Right, I'm gonna go. See you later, take care. See you, Matt, bye. Um, Gavin, because I, oh, forgot to record. Um, are you happy to, to share your slides? Yeah, yeah, no problem at all. Like just I'll, in a PDF or something. Yeah, I'll, I'll yeah, I'll, I'll PDF it. Yeah, the, it's a uh, about a two hundred megabyte presentation with all the videos, so I'll, um, <laughs> I won't share the PowerPoint. But yeah, perfectly happy to um to share the slides. Okay, that would be great. Thank you so much. Honestly, so interesting. I do, you've probably got to go and do kid stuff, haven't you? Like or something? Or... Well, I'm, I'm avoiding it because um, okay. kids are having a sleepover tonight. So, uh, yeah. Um, as in at our house, not at someone else's house. Oh, okay. So there's oh, yeah, four yeah. children instead of two. Stay where you are. Um, <laughs> because I, I did, I mean, I, don't, I hope you don't mind me sort of hijacking you at the end, but I've been trying to get a grant to do some work about uh, schema formation in children, looking at what I was actually looking at was them spooning things that have different weight and different movements. So it could mm. be dry sand, wet sand, polystyrene balls, ball bearings. Um, so they behave in different ways and, and the children have to adjust their movement based on, on you know, the behavior of the material. Yeah. Um, to look at how quickly they adapt to the task to see if there is some um, link between that and um, schema formation, executive function, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And so that's why I was interested in seeing whether you, you'd looked at how quickly the children adapt between the two groups, but it sounds like you did and there was nothing. Well, it, it's, it's more, it's just not the right task because it's yeah. conflating adaptations of two different things, the size and the mass so that you can't look at adaptation in the nice sort of way that you're talking about here, where it's a weird situation and they're learning how for it to not be a weird situation anymore. Mm, yeah. Here, in, in my task, you've just basically broken all the contingencies between the physical environment and those properties. So they can never properly adapt. They can change their behavior, but I wouldn't call that adaptation in the same way that, that you're talking about. Mm. Your, your task seems interesting though. I've, I've never come across that one before. Um, well, it's something that I've we've been developed with um, Andy told me, but we can't get funding for it. Okay. Well, we, we put forward two grant proposals and they got rejected, but <laughs> we'll keep trying, keep trying. It's just, uh, uh, no, I, normally I would try and get maybe a master's student to do a pilot, but in the current environment, we haven't yeah. been able to get into school, so. Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. I mean, th this is why we were sending out these VR headsets, because... Um, yeah, we were never going to get people in for a more formal, try this out and tell us what you think, which is, I guess, sort of how I imagined the project would be at the uh, at the start of all this. Although I'm I'm totally sold on sending stuff to people now. I, I really enjoyed that process. Yeah, it seemed amazing. I want to join your lab. Yeah. <laughs> There's a, a bunch of uh, parents of children who are slightly miffed because now their kids are bugging them for a VR headset for Christmas. Oh, yeah. That little taster of it. <laughs> Yeah, so I've got a, a PhD student that's looking uh, at robotics, trying to externalize the executive function development using robotics. And that's going to be expensive. And that's yeah. going to cause a lot of kids to go, Mom. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> anyway, I shall now let you go and say thank you once again. It was such an interesting talk. It really, really was. I'm so pleased that you agreed to come and talk to us. Oh, well, again, thanks so much for having me. I've, I've really enjoyed this. Me too. <laughs> and very nice to meet you. Hopefully, uh, hopefully we'll uh, see each other in person. Yeah, yeah. So we just go from Twitter to this and then eventually face to face. It was nice to meet you. Likewise, you. likewise. Yeah, all the best. And, and Have thanks, a good everyone. Evening. See you. Bye. Bye-bye.